When I was younger, my siblings and I were all lined up in the dining room like we usually were when my father wanted to question us. As my mother guided us to the middle of the room, I took my place at the far right of the line of four children. We were always arranged according to height rather than age, which really bothered me. I was the oldest after all, but I was also the shortest, and being placed at the end of the line made me feel as if I ranked lower than my siblings. My sister Karen, with her fortunate pituitary gland, had about six inches on me and stood at the far left. She seemed to relish every moment of it. Maybe if I had taken the time to put my shoes on, I would have been tall enough to be second to last, next to my brother Kevin, three years younger than I am. But there I stood, short and feeling useless. My bare feet felt strangely cold on the hardwood floor, considering that it was one of the hottest summers I can remember, and that our air conditioner had been broken for weeks. Our arrangement by height was the idea of my mother, who probably got the idea from our bookshelves, which were ordered with multicolored stickers of varying numbers indicating category, a system whose code I never cracked. The gradually decreasing slope of children seemed to ease her mind whenever she was assigned the task of gathering us together for whatever punishment my father was ready to dole out. When my mother left the room to fetch her inquisitor, my brother and sisters threw a few curious glances in my direction. Even though I looked and felt insignificant, I was still the oldest and most experienced, and in their eyes, I might have something useful to say, or a look that said, I'll deal with this. As usual, I could offer no such reassurance and just looked at my bare feet. I had absolutely no idea what was about to happen. I was sweating nervously, not because of the heat, but because I remembered what happened the last time we were questioned. A few weeks earlier, on a Sunday when we were getting dressed for church, we were herded into the dining room in the same fashion, shoes untied, dresses not fully zipped, shirts half tucked in. The reason for this inquisition was that my father's hairbrush had gone missing, and he intended to find out who among us was the thief. My mother was almost placed alongside us in his rage, but she was spared the humiliation, not because she was a parent, but because she was the only one in the family shorter than I was, by a mere three-eighths of an inch. According to her own guidelines, she should have been at the tail end, and would likely have felt as low as I usually do. Instead, she orbited near my father's much larger frame, and pretended that his actions were wholly justified. But after a few minutes with no confession and no scapegoat, he used what he believed was a surefire confession method. I'll leave right now, threatened. I'll leave and you'll never see me again. We all knew that he was born and secretly hoped that he actually would walk out the door, but he had a way of altering his tone that made us all scared that he might actually go through with it this time. Seeing that his threat was starting to work, he raised his voice in hopes of getting a stronger reaction out of us. It was around this time that I started to drift away, as I often did when getting scolded. Whenever I felt threatened by my father, I inexplicably started to look through him, losing focus on him and everything he was saying. The lamp, dining room furniture, and the sound of my sister's beating hearts were all clear. It was as if my father was the only object in the room being sucked into a black hole, one particle at a time. First, it was his head that was pulled away from him. When that part of his body became a singularity, his neck and throat were next, muffling his voice even further until he sounded even more distant than before. More of his body kept disappearing until he was just a small dot in the middle of a perfectly normal dining room, barely able to speak at all. It was calming, but in the throes of bliss, I usually lost my balance and nearly fell over, which ruined any progress towards making him disappear completely. He was still standing there when I snapped out of it. I steadied myself, and he looked no more relieved than when he started. I was alone in the room with him presumably because he dismissed all of us when he was tired of having to bluff over a hairbrush. No one had confessed, and I had obviously not been paying attention, so he told me to get ready for church and then stormed out of the room. While we were at church, he found the hairbrush under the couch. He didn't apologize. After waiting for what felt like days, my father entered the dining room and paced in front of us, trying to gather his thoughts. It only made us more nervous, and more quick glances were shared whenever he blinked. The air around us was different. He wasn't belching fire or perspiring heavily. He seemed calmer than normal. All of our eyes focused on his forehead as he opened his mouth to speak, but he was interrupted by the doorbell. He huffed and went to answer it. After about 30 seconds of what seemed like happy chatting at the door, three small stocky men shoved an enormous stand-up piano into our living room. As quickly as they had entered, they tipped their hats to us and left. We didn't make a peep. We were still in character as a silent row of children. My father re-entered the dining room, chest stuck out boastfully, 
and announced that we were the proud owners of an upright piano. He paused for applause or oohs and ahs of admiration, but the only response he received was our brows furrowing in his direction. Realizing our mistake, all of our eyes quickly went to our shoes, which were desperately trying to shift imaginary dirt around on the hardwood floor. But we were too late, and he noticed that we weren't as appreciative of the gift as he had envisioned. Immediately, the volume of his voice started to raise. I tried to stop myself, but I found my father getting smaller and smaller yet again, moving out of focus. This time, he was on a treadmill moving backwards in an underwater tunnel. The further away he got, the more the sound of water filled my ears. I stopped fighting and embraced him until all I could hear were bubbles and the crashing waves miles above me. I felt something nudge my arm and I lost my balance. When I came back to reality, I was on the floor with an aching knee, but my father was beating at me. In my trance, it appeared as if I had somehow agreed to take piano lessons. My siblings looked grateful for my unexpected sacrifice, but I could see a hint of smugness in their eyes. I was dropped off at Mr. Nyheisel's studio on the following Tuesday after school with a check for $8 in my hands. His studio was actually his enormous old house, which hadn't been maintained in decades. Ivy ran up the brick walls and a few windows had cracks in them. Its porch looked like the mouth of a monster. Nonetheless, I forced myself up the stairs to the house and rang the doorbell, which played a dull, twinkly version of when the saints go marching in. A few minutes later, a smiling old man answered the door. He looked the way everyone's grandpa did in the 70s, or more accurately, like every audience member of the Lawrence Welk Show. Thick turtle shell framed glasses, crimson tipped nose, over starched white button up shirt, tweed slacks, and a wide gap in his yellowy teeth. He smelled like coffee with too much sugar in it. He probably played football in his younger days. He introduced himself as Earl, shook my small shaking hand, and invited me in. Over the next few weeks, I grew accustomed to the coffee smell of Earl and the roughness of his life, even though we focused solely on the piano lessons. I wanted to ask him about his life because he seemed like the type that would have thousands of great stories, but he carried a quiet sadness with him and I didn't want to unearth him. His house told the stories for him. I guess by the pictures on the walls that his wife was dead, and he didn't have any children since the only pictures of kids he had around were former students, usually brandishing some sort of trophy or Looking around at the mementos of his life was slightly depressing, so I made it a point to start banging on the keys as soon as I got inside the studio even if he had to grab his lesson plans. No matter how much noise I made, he looked proud of me. He called me a natural and said I learned him twice as quickly as his other students. By the end of the month, I would master Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, Old Joy, Claire de and his favorite, When the Saints Go March, which always made him tap his foot and smile, especially when I was improvised like a soul. He decided to skip more of the basic tunes and moved me on to begin his classical and jazz music. The lesson started to go on longer than scheduled. After we were finished, it stopped me from running out the doors to play some of his old records and introduced me some of the great jazz pianists, McCoy Tyner, Red Garden, Polonius Monk, the Lewis. I wasn't initially interested in that style of music, but seeing Earl get so excited about it made me want to play it just for him. So I did. He even let me take the records home sometimes and called my listening to them homework. When I got home, my father caught me trying to smuggle the records into my room. In a move that I never expected, he loaded straight no chaser onto the record player and danced around the house with my mother. It was one of the only times I'd seen them laughing together. There was a little black-haired girl down the street who used to come around from time to time to play dolls with my sister Laura. I couldn't stand her, really. Her hands were always sticky and her hair was always a mess. She picked her nose and wiped the snot on her shirt. She had that annoying voice that kids sometimes have where they can't pronounce R's correctly and replace them with W's. When we got the piano, she would show up more often than usual and sometimes sit on the bench when no one was in the room, but she never touched the keys. One time, I found her sobbing on the bench after she and my sister had a scuffle involving who would feed the baby. It was right around the time I was supposed to practice and she was in my way. Rather than try to convince her to move to the couch to cry, I instead sat down next to her and started playing John Cleese Train's Take on Green Sleeves. It didn't stop her tears, but she finally took her hands from her face to see who had interrupted her cry at the time. I'm not sure how long she stared at me, but the instant I looked over at her big, wet, blue eyes, she looked away and focused her eyes on the piano itself. I returned my eyes to the sheet music and continued to pace through the tune. The girl's eyes wouldn't move from where they were fixed. She hardly even blinked. 
As soon as I finished the song, she hopped off the bench, walked out of the door, and ran home. She hadn't said a word. From then on, she stopped visiting my sister completely, and only came over when I was playing the piano. It was as if she wandered around our yard waiting to hear the first note, so she could sneak in our front door and slide next to me on the bench. After she settled in, she was always silent and still. The only time there was any sound besides the music was when my brother caught the two of us in a seat together and guffawed at the sight. My mother would sometimes watch us from the dining room entryway and smile to herself while my scorned sister would glare at her from the top of the stairs. None of these would-be interruptions seemed to bother her. In fact, she never gave any indication that she noticed my family's presence, or even my own. She was only interested in the music. Eventually, I became so comfortable with her sitting with me at practice that I often forgot she was there. I started to forget what her voice sounded like, and how sticky her hands were, and how messy her hair was. She was a ghost I could feel breathing and preparing for each chord. This serene image I had of the girl was ruined when I was playing her favorite song, which is ironically titled That's All by Ahmad Jamal. My sister Laura, tired of being shunned, marched loudly down the stairs to confront the girl. She said how she shouldn't be hanging around since they were no longer friends. She said that it was weird that she was over here so much, just to listen to some songs on the piano. She called her ugly and fat and stupid and every mean thing a little girl can say to another little girl, all within the same sentence. I stopped playing the song so I could try to stop my sister's slew of insults, but the black-haired girl opened her mouth to defend herself. In an instant, I was reminded of why I couldn't stand her. She was no longer my silent sidekick whose face I had nearly forgotten. She wasn't even that sobbing mess with big, wet, blue eyes. She just wasn't the same girl who sat at the piano with me all those times anymore. The shouting between the two girls didn't stop until Laura stomped back up the stairs, so livid that a storm cloud could have been hovering over her head with lightning threatening to strike her ears. The girl stood there for a moment and seemed to remember what she had been doing right before the fight. She looked at the piano and her eyes widened, but she didn't look at me. She shielded her face from my eyes as she ran out the door, and she never came over to see me play again. I don't even remember her name anymore. When I was once again alone in practicing, I dedicated myself to the instrument and was practicing almost every night, much to Earl's delight and my siblings' discontent. Earl had suggested I take a break from jazz and try my hand at some intermediate classical music like Mozart and Chopin, but I continued to practice jazz in secret. In a few months' time, I had finally learned Monk's Straight No Chaser and tried to play it for my parents as soon as I thought I had it figured out. Regardless of my main mistakes, they smiled and applauded politely, but they didn't dance like they had to the record. Something about that damaged my ego. I desperately wanted to recreate the moment when they were laughing together, and knowing that I had failed upset me more than I cared to admit. I committed myself to mastering the song, no matter how long it took. I thought that maybe if I played it properly and didn't make any mistake at all, I could make it happen. My father soon grew weary of hearing the same song played repeatedly and demanded my triumph. I obliged him to avoid being further scolded, but whenever he wasn't home, I put all my effort into straightening the chaser until I not only knew every note and chord, but exactly how hard Monk had pressed on the keys. I could play it with my hands behind my back. I could actually play the song backwards. I was ready to try it again. I came home from school on a Monday afternoon and found that the corner of the room that housed the piano was empty. I paced furiously in the basement until my father got home from work. I demanded an explanation immediately. He called the rest of my siblings into the dining room and lined us all up once again. For the first time, even though I was the shortest, I was placed on the left side of the line instead of the right. I finally felt like I mattered and my position as oldest child was secure. I felt a bit better until my father looked at me with heartbreaking eyes and announced that we were going through a rough patch financially and had to sell the piano. I found myself looking through him once again but he wasn't being sucked into a black hole or moving backwards through an underwater tunnel. He appeared blurry and unfocused, and I realized that I was crying. The next day, I went to Earl's studio as usual, but didn't have a check for $8 in my hand. I looked at his tattered old house and had a hard time making myself get up his stairs. I rang the doorbell, and when the saints go marching in, no longer chimed throughout his house. It was straight no chaser. <laughs> 